It's a story that inspires Hollywood. The movie Unbroken tells the tale of Louis Zamperini, an American hero who suffers one of the most horrific experiences of World War II, including brutalization by a Japanese prison guard. I just don't know how someone can endure that. In the film, Zamperini survives, and there's a happy ending when he returns to America. What it doesn't show was that he was traumatized by the horrors he faced. Yet instead of succumbing to his nightmares, he finds God and forgives the man that had tortured him. In many ways, it's the most remarkable part of his story that would stagger most ordinary men. It is this extraordinary tale of redemption that is the real story of Louis Zamperini. In 2014, Hollywood gathers for the release of the film Unbroken, directed by Angelina Jolie. It's the story of Louis Zamperini, a man who first came to the world's attention in 1936. At Adolf Hitler's notorious Nazi Showcase Olympics. At just 19 years old, Zamperini has made it into the 5,000 meter final. He had been on course to become a juvenile delinquent until his life was transformed by running. He was a thief, he was a prankster, and every cop in Torrance knew him by name because they had brought him home so many times. Running was really the thing that, that made him uh, come out of a life that could have ended up just being nothing but uh, incarceration and misery. The Torrance tornado may have achieved success in America, but nothing is expected of the teenager on this world stage. He was racing against the finest, fastest runners in the world. Zamperini's trailing in 12th place until his final lap. His trademark was that at the end of the run, he would sprint. He ran that last lap in 56 seconds. It was unheard of. Zamperini may only finish eighth, but his final charge electrifies the crowd. It got all the people in the stadium to stand up on their feet and take notice, including Adolf Hitler. The Nazi leader is so impressed, he asks to meet Zamperini. Here's Herr Hitler going, ah, the boy with the fast finish and reaching down to shake his hand. So my dad had to like reach up and it said it was kind of a really flaccid, flimsy handshake, and then it was all over. Zamperini may not have finished with a medal, but he knows his time is to come. By the 1940 Olympics, he'll be at the peak of his powers. I know that four years later, had they had the Olympics, I just feel in my heart that he would have won a gold medal. But the dictator Zamperini has just shaken hands with will destroy his Olympic dreams by taking humanity into a world war. Five years later, Japanese forces attack Pearl Harbor. And America enters World War II. Zamperini puts his Olympic dreams on hold to join a bomber crew in the Air Force. 
After five months fighting in the Pacific, Zamperini and his crew are searching for downed airmen when his bomber loses power to its engines. At 800 feet, this thing just cartwheeled over and dove into the ocean. And when that crashed, he said, when we hit that water, it felt like somebody hit me in the head with a sledgehammer. Zamperini is one of just three survivors of an 11-man crew, now adrift in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. No one say you can it's an ordeal that will last 47 days. They survive off whatever rainwater they can collect and the occasional fish and seabird. I think that a lot of people would just give up on the will to live and that would take them, but these guys were fighters and they weren't giving up. At one point, they're even strafed by a Japanese aircraft. But their real battle is against starvation and dehydration. Mac. Eventually, after 33 days adrift, one of the three survivors dies. Zamperini himself is barely alive. Here they were with no shade whatsoever in equatorial Pacific waters. Uh, they'd been out of water for a week, and it was this point that my dad knew they were going to die. It's now that Zamperini makes a promise. He said, God, if you bring me home alive from this ordeal, I'll seek you and serve you for the rest of my life. And within an hour, a small cloud appeared on the horizon, and it got larger and larger, and it started to rain. And they got there with upturned faces, drinking in the rain, and they had enough to, to, uh, to last several more days. On the 46th day adrift, Zamperini spots land. Ocean currents have pushed them over 2,000 miles. They have survived longer adrift in an inflated raft than anyone has ever managed before. But the land Zamperini has spotted are the Marshall Islands. And they're occupied by the Japanese. When the Japanese picked him up, they weighed him. And they weighed him at 66 pounds. He'd lost nearly 60% of his body mass. Zamperini is now one of 34,000 American prisoners of war that will be captured by the Japanese. All will be subject to appalling deprivations. Over the next year, Zamperini is sent to a series of camps across the Pacific. From Kwajalein Atoll, via Truk Island, then on to Ofuna, on the Japanese home islands, and onwards to Amori, near Tokyo. It's here where his ordeal will reach horrifying depths. Enter the bird. Prison guard Mutsuhiro Watanabe. The man who will go on to haunt Zamparini's nightmares. He walks up and he smacks him across the face. He says, don't look me, don't look at me. Then he's looking away, and so he says, now look at me. You get me! So he looks at him, and he smacks him again. So whether he looked at him or didn't look at him, 
he was getting beaten over the head with this kendo stick. Zamparini has been picked out because of who he is. When Lewis arrived in camp, he did have his wallet. One of the items in his wallet was about him being an Olympian. So they knew who they had in their midst. And so because of that, he was singled out. He was put through sadistic torture. And the bird wanted nothing more than to break him. The prisoners call Watanabe the bird, an inoffensive nickname that should he hear it, won't provoke one of his vicious attacks. He was evil, sadistic, off the charts with his brutality. It was unbelievable. The bird would gain a fearsome reputation as one of the most vicious camp guards in Japan. What made the bird so terrifying is that he was so unpredictable. You just never knew when he would fly off in a rage, and you didn't know what would set him off. He beat his prisoners every day, uh -huh. fracturing their windpipes, rupturing their eardrums, and shattering their teeth. Straight! I think he was absolutely a sadist, and he saw this camp full of prisoners as an opportunity to have new playthings, new toys to torture and try to break. The bird's brutality wasn't just physical. He would also play mind games with them. He would even take pleasure in showing prisoners their letters from home, then burning their unopened correspondence in front of them. He had to be crazy or a sadist. The things he did like those letters, that's, that's one of the worst things in the world I could think of. Anything that gave the prisoners hope he wanted to destroy. It was almost an exercise in, in power and manipulation to see how far he could push these guys. Even the other guards thought he was crazy, but nobody challenged him. He could do whatever he wanted to them. He was just a loose cannon. When you are in a savage situation, you can either rise to, to be civilized or descend into the savagery. The bird's disturbed behavior seems to stem from his own inadequacies. Watanabe was uh, from a wealthy Japanese family. Uh, all of his uh, male siblings were officers in the Japanese military system, and he washed out of, of officer school. In the Japanese system of honor, Watanabe's job offers him nothing. By surrendering, the Allied prisoners are regarded as the lowest of the lows. Guarding men like Zamparini is an insult. He felt that because he was in charge of all these subhuman allied prisoners, that he could do whatever he wanted to them. You know, war brings out the best and the worst in people. It brought out the best in my dad. It brought out the worst in Watanabe. Now Zamparini is going to bear the brunt of the bird's personal inadequacies through humiliation and torture. He was going to break him, no matter what. For months on end, Zamparini cannot escape from Watanabe's inexhaustible hatred. He becomes the bird's plaything. He was telling Lewis, you need to stand at attention. and he takes off his belt. And whacks Lewis across the face. And the bird looks at him and he says, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I didn't want to hurt you. Here, let's clean you up. And Lewis thought, wow, he might be showing a, a small act of kindness. And a moment later, the bird strikes him again in the same spot. 
completely trying to give this man hope and take it away from him. Zamparini's problem is that he is everything that the bird is not, a winner. Lewis had fame. Lewis was respected. Lewis went to the Olympics. So he took it all out on Lewis. But soon, Zamparini's notoriety does earn him an unexpected break from his persecution. He is summoned to Tokyo. Lewis was asked to do a radio broadcast in Tokyo. Hello, mother and father, brother and friends. This is your Louis talking. The Japanese want to exploit his Olympic fame for propaganda. For Zamparini, it's a chance to let his family know he's still alive. For them, it's a massive shock. Months earlier, they'd been told he was dead. And this would be the first time that his parents would hear his voice in over two and a half years. And there's more hope for Louis. When he returns to the camp, the bird receives new orders and is sent away. And to Louis, this must have felt like the thrill of a lifetime to know that his nemesis would soon be gone. The bird's reign of terror appears to be over. And it gets better. Today, our guns are on target. By February 1945, America is edging ever closer to Japan. And its new high-tech bombers are within range of Japan's cities. The prisoners can hear and see them. Zamparini uses skills he learned as a young thief to steal food for himself and his fellow prisoners to stay alive. He dares to believe he might make it to the war's end. After more than a year and a half in captivity, Zamparini is moved to a new camp called Naoetsu on the west coast of Japan. He and his fellow prisoners are herded in to meet their new guards. And they're waiting and they're waiting and waiting. And out steps the bird. That was a low moment in his whole life. At that point, my dad thought that if he had a gun, he'd have blown his brains out. In Naoetsu, the bird resumes his beatings and humiliation of Zamparini. Louis is walking with 100 pounds of coal on his back. Louis struggles under his heavy load when a Japanese guard decides to have some fun. So he fell about three or four feet with this load of coal on his back, and it injured his ankle. It is an injury that will later have devastating consequences. <gasps> day after day, the bird continues to humiliate Zamparini. One torture session is depicted in the feature film. The bird commanded him to hold this giant beam above his head. And told the other officers, if Louis drops this, shoot him. and the bird is watching him hold it, just waiting for him to break. Hmm, 
the veins in Louis's neck, they said, were sticking out. The pain was just unbearable. Zamparini refuses to buckle, and the bird's frustration boils over. So he just goes and he socks him right in the stomach. In there! And takes him down, and just his rage is burning at this point. <laughs> Yet still, Zamparini isn't broken. Sir! August 1945. An American B-29 drops an atomic bomb on Hiroshima to bring the war to an end. Shortly after, the Japanese surrender. Some 20,000 American prisoners of war are now free. Amongst them, Louis Zamperini. As for the bird, he goes into hiding to avoid arrest for war crimes and disappears. In Unbroken, Angelina Jolie's Hollywood movie, it's at this point that Zamperini's troubles finish. But this is not what happens. Zamparini's battle with his post-war demons will be as powerful as anything in the movie. In fact, the most important part of his story is about to begin. It starts when Zamparini returns to America, a war hero, widely celebrated in the press and on the radio. When Louis got home after the war, you know, he was right there in Los Angeles and he was the toast of Hollywood. Everyone wants to hear the Olympic runner's epic story of survival. So he found himself actually having to tell the story and it was very difficult for him and he would have to take a couple of shots of something strong like whiskey to, to be able to start. Right across the board, Zamparini's life seems to be on the up. In March 1946, he takes a trip to Miami. There, he meets the 20-year-old Cynthia Applewhite. And he just looks at her and goes, girl of my dreams. When Lewis met Cynthia and fell in love, that love was all-consuming. And uh, this ended up being my mom. By May, they were married. Cynthia tells her new husband that she'll help him forget his past, and he grasps her promise as a lifeline. He thought that I am going to lead a happy life now. At Wembley, great preparations are now going ahead in readiness for the first post-war Olympic Games, which are being... In 1946, Zamparini feels a familiar pull. He sets his sights on the 1948 London Olympics. This time, he wants to compete for a shorter distance. Instead of the 5,000 metres, he's aiming for the Blue Ribboned event. He still wants to break the four-minute mile. Come on, Louie! Come on! He begins clocking four minutes and 18 seconds. <laughs> the Torrens tornado is on his way back. By August 1946, Zamparini is pushing himself to his limits and he runs and he's sprinting. And all of a sudden, he feels his muscle tear. The damage is a legacy of the injury caused to his ankle whilst working for the bird.
Zamperini realizes his Olympic dream is now in ruins. He can never be an elite athlete again. And the fact that he got stopped almost as soon as he started was really, really tough on him. And so then he began to really spiral out of control at that point. With Zamparini's Olympic hopes crushed, his life begins to fall apart. The war comes back to haunt him. He had a recurring nightmare every single night. And in that nightmare, uh, he was being beaten by the bird. It was still with him up here, and he could not make it go away. He just, he couldn't run away from it. In his despair, Zamparini starts thinking of revenge. He hatches a plan to return to Japan to murder the bird. And in his dreams, he would be dreaming of killing the bird, just strangling him to death every night. The hatred that he had for the bird and his desire to seek revenge on him, it really did drag him down. Zamparini becomes consumed by hate. When he isn't plotting to kill, he's drinking heavily. Everybody was buying him drinks. And he, he was drinking them all. The drinking was terrible. The nightmares were worse. Even the birth of his daughter, Sissy, can't drag Zamparini away from the bird. And one night, events come to a head. One night he wakes up, he's got his hands around the bird's throat. only to realize that he's sitting on top of my mom and she's choking the life out of her. <laughs> For Cynthia, it's the final straw and she makes the heartbreaking decision to leave Louis and file for divorce. He was a danger to his wife, a danger to his daughter, a danger to himself. He had let anger and hatred take over his heart. This was just about uh, at the end of his rope. Zamparini's life has fallen apart. But what happens next is truly inspiring. He embarks on a journey to forgive his tormentors, even the bird. We've come to see if we can make some contribution to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We come here to try to this journey begins when Zamparini's wife is invited to hear an evangelical preacher. A young preacher named Billy Graham had come to Los Angeles and was doing a series of these big tent sermons. Graham's message offers redemption, love, and peace in a world that has been brutalized by war. For Cynthia, it's electrifying. She wants to share it with Louis. She came home that night and said, Louis, because of the newfound peace in my heart, I'm not going to divorce you. Of course, this was great news to him. 
She says, but I want you to go with me to hear this guy preach tomorrow night. And I said, there's no way I'm going to go. And she's like, pretty much our marriage is going to rely on this. You need to go and hear what he has to say. So reluctantly, he goes. At first, Zamparini feels nothing. He thought he'd be there, listen to a few folks, and then leave, and that would be it, and he will have done his duty. But then Graham's words start to strike home. And then he hears Graham say, when you reach the end of your rope and you have no place else to turn, that's when men turn to God to save them from whatever situation they're in. It was at that moment he remembered this prayer that he had on the life raft on the day that they hadn't had water for a week. And that prayer that said, Lord, if you get me home from this alive, I will seek you and serve you my entire life. And then he realized that he hadn't held up his end of the bargain, even though he had made it out of his mess. And at that point, every word that Billy was saying seemed like it was directed straight at him. Zamparini and his wife returned together to their family home. From now on, his life will be transformed by faith. It was pretty instantaneous that the moment he made a decision to forgive, he was no longer afraid, he was no longer plagued by nightmares. That night, Louis has his first full night of sleep for over five years. With his newfound faith, Zamparini is the happiest he's been since the war began. His marriage is back on track, and he's a man on a mission, spreading the gospel all over America. <laughs> then five years after the war's end, Zamparini receives an unexpected invitation. As part of a Christian mission, he's offered the chance to return to Japan to visit his former prison guards. He wanted to find not only the bird, but the other guards and let them know that he forgave them. But Zamparini fears that his faith may not be strong enough, especially when it comes to meeting his chief tormentor, the bird. And he's thinking, Okay, now I know in my heart I've forgiven my captors for what they did to me, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to face them face to face and, uh, and still have the same attitude. When Louis arrives in Japan, over 4,000 Japanese war criminals have been brought to justice by the American occupation force. After the war, many of Louis's guards were imprisoned until an amnesty in 1958. Most were kept in Sugamo prison. It is here that Louis decides to visit. It is the first time in over five years that he will see his tormentors. To his surprise, he discovers he can forgive. He tells them about the brutality at their hands and what it did to him and how he went home a damaged person. Then when he became a Christian, he was able to forgive them. And uh, that's why I'm here today, so I'll let you know that. After making a speech, he seeks out some of the men that had abused him in person. I remember Louis saying that those guards were astonished when he would hold out his hand and talk to him and forgive him. They, they, they couldn't believe it. But there's one person that's missing. And he's looking around and he goes, well, where's the bird? Then Zamparini is told some disturbing news. 
the bird has killed himself. The authorities looking for him thought he was dead. His own parents thought he was dead. And so my dad thought he was dead. Zamperini is shocked at first, but then feels something he has never felt for his former tormentor. Compassion. The bird's treatment of Louis had such a long-lasting effect on Louis. Maybe he thought that that also had a long-lasting effect on the bird himself, and that maybe over time, the bird's own guilt had eaten at him to the point where he killed himself. And I think that there was probably some regret there that he didn't get a chance to help him. With the bird dead, Zamparini's mission of forgiveness appears to be over. Over the next 40 years, he will successfully bring up a family. But there's a final twist in the tale. 1991. Japan is awarded the Winter Olympics, which will be held seven years later. The city of Nagano. In an act of reconciliation, Zamperini is invited to become a torchbearer. He will carry it through Naoetsu, the town where he was held captive at the end of the war. Zamparini's story is so remarkable that the CBS Olympics team led by producer Dragan Mahalovic decides to make a film about him. So there I start to read the story of the raft, the crash, 47 days in Central Pacific, POW camp, the bird, the beatings. And I thought, holy smokes, whoa, this sounds like a great story. Mahalovic's research leads to a discovery that will turn everything on its head. One day my dad gets a phone call and it's the producer. And he says, Louis, uh, are you sitting down? I said, Louis, um, you're not gonna believe this. He said, what? I said, Louis, the bird's alive. The former prison guard is now a millionaire living near Tokyo. After the war, uh, he hid out in the hills, and when amnesty was granted to the guards, he came back and became an insurance man. Mahalovich wants to film an interview with the bird. After some persuasion, he agrees. The interview is carried out by CBS correspondent Bob Simon. So Bob asks the question, says, why is it that of all the prison guards, the prisoners considered you the most brutal of them all? Um, he went to great lengths to emphasize that he was not given orders by the Japanese military, that these were his personal feelings. And if he occasionally struck out at the prisoners, as Zamperini said, then that was because of his own personal feelings at the time. During the interview, Watanabe shows no remorse. If Zamperini said that he was being kicked and beaten, then they probably happened. He also went to great lengths to remind us that in Caucasian society, kicking and beating may be seen as cruel behavior, but it's not as big a deal, at least, of uh, the Japan of 1943. After the interview, Mahalovic asks Watanabe if he will meet Zamperini when he visits for the 1998 Olympics. He agrees. January 1998. Zamperini arrives in Japan to carry the Olympic torch. He's deeply nervous about meeting the man who had invaded his nightmares for so long. He had come to terms with the fact that this guy was dead. He didn't have to confront him. He didn't have to forgive him. He didn't have to seek redemption. 
And now suddenly that's back in play, and I think Louis was thinking about this quite hard. That was going to be the big test, you know. The person, the object of his hate, could he look him in the eye and tell him, I love you, which is what he had to tell the rest of them. Mahalovich tries to confirm the details for the meeting, but the bird has had second thoughts. We placed a phone call to Watanabe, and Watanabe said, no interest. I don't have any interest in meeting him. I don't know if Watanabe didn't want to be forgiven, didn't want any part of this, but uh, that was it. The meeting never happens, but Samparini pens a letter that is delivered to the bird's house. If he read the contents, he would have found nothing but compassion from the man who he had victimized. Under your discipline, my rights, not only as a prisoner of war, but also a human being, were stripped from me. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble. But thanks to a confrontation with God through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Christ. Love replaced the hate I had for you. Watanabe would die five years later. He would never reply. In 1998, Zamperini runs the Olympic torch through the town of Nawetsu, just miles away from the camp where the bird had brutalized him. But those horrors are long gone. When Lewis was invited to carry the torch through the very town where he was held prisoner, I think his life had come full circle. And that was very powerful for Lewis. Zamparini passes away in 2014 at the age of 97. He's celebrated as a true American hero. Months later, the film Unbroken is released. There is no doubt that Zamparini's wartime trials are worthy of any feature film. But the real story never makes it to the big screen. I think that what makes Louis' story so unique isn't necessarily all the trials that he went through, that he survived the 47 days at sea, or the two and a half years in prison camp. What's so phenomenal about his story is that through all of that, he did manage to forgive the bird. He did manage to forgive his captors. And instead of letting himself be destroyed, he brought love and life to, to others. He didn't just want to be a hero. He wanted to share the good part and show that people can be forgiven. That was his legacy, forgiveness. <laughs>